Okay, somebody asked our sister Sui last week, what is Vitaka and Vichara? Remember, when you know you're in Samadhi, if you know you have Vitaka, you have Vichara, you have Piti, you have Sukha and Aikagata. Meaning, you need to have applied attention. Sustain attention, bodily bliss, mental bliss, and you have stillness of the mind. Okay? So what is this attention, vitaka? And then you sustain the attention when you meditate. That's all there is to it. Okay. You do housework. Some of you do housework, right? So you sweep the floor and you clean up the house. You take notice of what you do. You pay attention, is it not? And then you have sustained the attention. Because if you don't, you'll end up watching Korean drama serial instead of cleaning your house. Do you like to work? We'd rather do something else. But we work because we need to earn a living. So we work happily, we go. And we pay attention to the work. And we sustain the attention, correct? We talk about chara. Then you read a book, The Straits Times, in the morning. You pay attention and you have sustained attention. Similarly, for all these chores, you have an object, right? An object to which you pay attention to. Then in meditation, eh? what is your object? In meditation, your object is either your breath, your whole body relaxation, or your heartbeat, correct? Or metta. So you also have an object. So what it means is you pay attention to your meditation object and you sustain that attention. Don't let other thoughts come in. Don't distract yourself with thinking. That's all. So if you get distracted, you know how to pull back the mind to your meditation object. Okay, so let's see, look at this. Just imagine this is the mind. Correct? And this is your meditation object. Correct? Okay. The mind will run all over the place. That's why you need an object. This object is here, so your mind is pulled to the object. Because if there's no object, I ask you to sit here and don't think, and you don't put your mind on the object, your mind will go to Siberia, Tibet, one whole round, Taiwan, and come back, and then go again another round. That's the reason why your mind needs a meditation object to anchor it to the present moment. So as you practice and you practice meditation, what will happen to this, this rope? What, what is this rope? What holds the object to the mind? What is that? What is this rope? What does it represent? Mindfulness, sati. Your mindfulness, your awareness. So as you meditate and meditate, your mindfulness becomes better and better stronger and stronger so it becomes a very thick rope initially when you start uh, okay this is not thick they're laughing initially when you start it's just a string and it becomes a very strong rope all right your awareness becomes much and much better so when you work right you're very disciplined you don't lose your handphone you can don't think beyond this morning because you know the past is not important you let go you don't worry about the future you know you don't think beyond tonight why because your sati, your mindfulness is stronger. You know how to pull your mind back. Then after a while, when you meditate, meditate okay, this is the mind. You don't really need an object anymore. You know why? Because you'll be paying attention to your whole awareness. All right. Then you know, oh, I pay attention to my awareness. Oh, okay. Then you know you have really progressed. Because at that time, you probably would know what the mind is. You would have s realized the mind. I do not say see, you feel the mind. Okay? So meditation, there is all there is to it. All you need to do is pay attention to relaxation initially, and then pay attention to an object, and then sustain that attention. And then we help you along the way by giving you prompters, right? Yeah, that's it. And during this time, what you're doing? Developing mental muscles. All right, a lot of muscles on huh? this mind, deconditioning and developing that sati. Okay, and the Noble Eightfold Path, remember? What's under samadhi? Right effort. Right effort seated here. 
right mindfulness and right concentration. And that's what you're doing. Okay? So are we ready to start? Okay. Okay, we are doing the second part of morality today. And this Dhamma topic wraps up the whole series of Dhamma by topics on morality in relation to right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Okay, uh, last week, in case some of you are not here, what we did, we looked at the types and classification of moral practices where uh, we see how right speech, right action, right livelihood can be reclassified into other moral themes because the Buddha had to reach out to different types of audience. So um, we focused on the central principles like um, three bases of meritorious deeds, the five precepts, the ten wholesome causes of action, and we see how they are related to one another and how they fit into the Noble Eightfold Path. And the second part, which is the structure of the moral training, uh, the teaching of all Buddhas is avoiding evil, doing good, purifying the mind. Okay, and we, had, we saw how, why avoiding evil comes first before doing good. And the main reasons, first is simplicity of action, because to avoid evil simply means to hold yourself back from doing unwholesome actions, which is actually very much easier in a way than doing good, because doing good, there are so many variables involved, depending on time and place, yes? The second part is freedom from remorse, because when you do good all the time, um, you, don't, you, you, you exercise sense restraint, you stop yourself from performing unwholesome actions, so you do not have regret. It is, a lot of times, it is the regret, the remorse that stops us from meditating effectively. So if you repeatedly break your five precepts, there is no way you can sit down and meditate in peace. And of course, these two contribute to a third reason, which is spiritual progression. You have to avoid evil. You have to let go of unwholesome states first before you can perform wholesome ones. Because trying to do good without avoiding evils, like what Ajahn Chah says, you're trying to, to dye a dirty piece of cloth. Okay, so now we have looked at the first two. We move down to the third one, okay? Because avoiding evil and do good actually falls in a domain of uh, sila or morality, okay? Now we look at, at morality as the foundation of spiritual practice. Before we explore this point, let's quickly revise the functions of morality, concentration, and wisdom. In the previous Dharma Bites, we have looked at the definitions by Pra Ajahn Dunatulo and Ajahn Jasaro. Today, we look at the definitions that are given by Zenro Payuto. Okay, this is the Noble Eightfold Path to those who are new to Buddhism. Okay, morality. Can you all see? Do, I don't need to read, right? Morality is how we live our life. It's about conduct and about behavior. Next, we have concentration. Morality is skillful behavior for verbal and physical actions, and concentration is skillful behavior with respect to your mind. Now for the benefit of those who are new, let me explain to you what conditioned phenomena is. Phenomena basically just means an experience, a process. And then you often hear in Buddhism, we talk about cause and effect. Okay, we always have to create causes and conditions. What does it mean? A seed is a cause. A tree is an effect. But for a seed to grow into a tree, you need the right conditions. You need oxygen, you need moisture, and a few other factors, right? Okay, now, what about condition? Let's say in terms of karma. 
let's, let's say, okay, you killed somebody in your previous life. So you accumulated bad karma. And let's say it's going to take fruition any time in this life if the conditions are right. One day you decide to cross the road without looking left and without looking right. What happened? This callousness, this lack of mindfulness creates the condition for this bad karma to take fruition. What happened? Kapong, a car hits you and you die a premature death. That is what you mean by cause and condition. Okay, so panya is also essential at the beginning part of our practice as intellectual knowledge. Okay, the Buddha Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha's instructions that come and form like a DIY, do it yourself manual. Okay, and it also supports your whole practice throughout the path. And then it culminates in insight wisdom that penetrates this truth, the true nature of mind and body in stages. It doesn't come in one go. Okay? Now let me show you an analogy. Now morality is like the clearing of the garbage on the lake of our mind. And this garbage represents the defilements of the mind that arise because of our three good friends, greed, hatred, and delusion. Okay? Greed, hatred, delusion, also called loba, dosa, and moha in Pali, are the three roots of evil that stay with us until we get enlightened. Now, concentration is the stealing of this lick of the mind. And wisdom, Panya, is looking into the depths of this lake of our mind to witness the true reality of mind and matter. So you can see very clearly from here that you need morality at the start point. The whole training starts with morality. Now, the training morality is the foundation. It involves, firstly, the intelligent adoption of standards of conduct towards the, the external world and particularly other human beings, and then learning how to be mindful of them in daily life and bring them to bear on our behavior. It is at this level of training that we see the central role of self-discipline. Okay, now, this self-discipline helps us to control the mind because we develop what we call mind muscles every time when we exercise sense restraint. Okay, and the stronger the right mind muscles, the more control we have over our verbal communication and physical actions. And we also develop mind muscles, like what Sister Xu Feng said just now, during meditation, every time when we hold our attention to the meditation object. Remember, you saw this last week at the right at the beginning of Dharma Bites. We're looking at the three levels of morality here. The first one, the system of ethics, the do's and don'ts, what you can do, what you shouldn't do. Then virtuous verbal and physical action that you're talking about, moral conduct, your behavior. And inner virtue, we're talking about inner qualities, wholesome qualities of like compassion, loving kindness, gratitude, contentment, etc., etc. Now, you can actually even see the threefold discipline here. Let me show you. First one, Panya. Now, this level of morality is based on intellectual wisdom that gives you the knowledge of what works and what doesn't work, right? Then, this one obviously is Sila because we're talking about conduct behavior. And this is Samadhi. Why? Because the inner qualities that we're talking about how do you cultivate them? Mainly through mental cultivation that is predominantly samadhi. And then these three come together to give you insight wisdom through direct experience. Again, uh, let me explain for those who are new what insight wisdom is. Okay, when we start out on a path, we're talking about intellectual wisdom. A lot of it is theoretical, okay? We refer to this theory to guide us on what to do, what not to do. 
And as you build the causes and conditions along the way, okay, what happens is that you are allowing this pania, this wisdom, okay, to mature bit by bit over the course of years sometimes, and in many cases, over lifetimes. Okay, and when, as and when this wisdom matures, okay, at times when you least expect it, you will get an insight. And this insight is not the eureka intellectual insight. Well, ah, I think I understand what this uh, phrase means already. And not that kind of insight. We're talking about insight that comes to you as an experience. And it doesn't need to be during meditation. I remember Venerable Gotami telling us about this teacher in Sri Lanka, how she was teaching her students. And all of a sudden, when she was writing on the blackboard, she actually saw her whole hand rotting in front of her. And at the moment, she understood this is impermanence. That is what you mean by insight. And you will not get scared, okay? That is what you mean by insight, right? So from here, we can see two things. Morality is a prerequisite for Dharma training. And number two, the threefold training of morality concentration and wisdom, they blend in together. They overlap each other okay, to such an extent that there is no way you can draw a distinct line to separate them. Okay, okay let me, before I go on, let me briefly explain to you the difference between Samatha and Vipassana practice. Okay, most people who do meditation outside Buddhism is mainly samatha. Samatha means you sit down, and what Sister Xu Fong said just now, you have vitaka, vichara, piti sukha, and sometimes ekakatha. That is mentioned uh, sometimes some, somewhere in the suttas, I think, but mostly in the commentaries. And you, in the process, you calm down your mind. The mind becomes very still. And you, have, you can actually sometimes develop psychic powers if you go deep enough, and you sometimes can see past lives and all that, okay? Now, Vipassana practice is unique to Buddhism. It is what you call contemplation practice, where you contemplate on the Buddha's teachings, normally in light of the three universal characteristics of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self. In Pali, it's called anicca, dukkha, anatta. And a lot of people start Dharma training by diving straight into Vipassana practice. And then they wonder why it isn't bearing fruit. Where insight leh? No insight. Okay? In fact, when uh, we first attended our Dharma class, we were just talking about it the other day. It's very, very funny. Uh, there are a lot of people who uh, complain to our meditation teacher, say, how come my meditation practice going nowhere? You know, I come for class week after week. No, I'm very diligent, practice, practice, going nowhere. And I think our teacher must be really fed up by hearing the same kind of complaints over and over again. You know what he told us in class? For those people, okay, who have not been progressing, I want you to go down to the second floor. That's where the Buddha Rupa is. Uh, and go and ask for forgiveness for all the <laughs> bad things you have done. What message is he trying to get across? That your foundation in morality is not strong enough, okay? But of course, there's another reason. Lah. You have not been doing enough samatha practice. You have not calmed down your mind. So much garbage swimming on, in the lake of your mind. How to see, lah, what to see? You cannot see anything, ma? So that's one reason. The other reason is foundation in morality. You need that, okay? Without that morality, you can't progress eh, in your spiritual life. Then, in that case, how did a serial killer like Angulimala end up becoming an Arahan? Arahan means you have full enlightenment, saw Nibbana, no more suffering. Okay? For those who are unfamiliar with the story of Angulimala, very quickly, um, he was actually a good person in the beginning. But his student, the, the, his uh, classmates got very jealous of him, uh, made the teacher turn against him. And the teacher told him that, uh, oh, you, you ask me what I want you to do? Okay, I want you to kill 1,000 people, collect their pinky finger, okay? 
And he said that thinking that Anguilla Mala wouldn't do that. But in those days, uh, they have great respect for the teachers, they're very obedient. So he actually went around on a killing spree. And thank goodness, the Buddha stopped him just before he killed his own mother. Okay? So if virtue is essential, obviously Anguilla Mala would not be able to progress on a path right. So what happened? First, he repented. Okay. Can you all read from the back? Can I? And then he threw away all his weapons. And he asked to join the Sangha. And in the Buddha's own words, he became celibate, virtuous, of good character. So what is the moral of the story? Number one, if you have done a lot of unwholesome deeds in your life, you still got hope. Okay? <laughs> Number two, for enlightenment to be possible, there must be a change in moral attitude and behavior. And number three, please do not follow his example because we do not have the Buddha around to help us. Okay? Wanting great insights without a grounding in moral action is like putting tremendous effort into rowing across the river without untying the boat from the dock. Okay, so not committing to this basic foundation of morality means you are skipping an essential step in the Noble Eightfold Path. If morality is not important, it wouldn't be in the Noble Eightfold Path in the first place. And from my experience of dealing with people, with Buddhist practitioners, a lot of them are just interested in meditation. Meditation is important, but you cannot neglect the other parts of the path as well. So, okay, we stop for tea break. According to the actions that they have performed. Okay, and from there he derived all these rules. Okay, based on again the law of cause and effect, which is the law of karma. What is karma? Karma means mental, verbal, and physical action. Now it also means results of action. And results of action, also known as vipaka, can come into fruition in this life or in subsequent lives. And it also determines where you are reborn within the 31 realms of existence. Now, if we keep breaking our moral precepts, we will accumulate unwholesome karma, which tends towards unfavorable rebirths. Now, although the Buddha usually refers to only these three, okay, hell, animal, and ghost realms, the realm four, which is the asura, or the demon realm, is also counted as an unfavorable rebirth. So, for one reborn as a human being, okay, killing or violence at minimum conduces to short lifespan. Stealing conduces to loss of wealth at the minimum. For sexual misconduct is enmity and rivalry. For lying, false accusations. For divisive speech conduces to divided from one's friends at the minimum. Harsh speech disagreeable sounds. This is for idle chatter. And lastly, uh, drinking that causes heedlessness at minimum conduces to madness and loss of intelligence. Now, generally, the form the suffering takes corresponds to the precept that you repeatedly violate. And let's see what we can find in other suttas as well. I'll give you some time to look through this on your own.
大きいのギャラおうそうは To all we women and also to some men, if we want to be good looking in our next life, <laughs> cool, calm, and collected is the key word. Okay? Don't get angry. When people make you angry, let go. Let go. Always think, I want to be good looking in my next life. Okay? <laughs> Now, these karmic effects can also bear fruit in this lifetime. Okay? As the Buddha says here. But since he has killed living beings, taken what is not given, misconducts himself, in sensual pleasures, speaks falsehood, speaks maliciously, speaks harshly, gossips, his covetous, has a mind of ill will, and holds wrong view. You see, these are the ten unwholesome causes of action. He will experience the result of that either here or now, which means in this lifetime, or in his next rebirth, or in some subsequent existence. Okay? But subject to the right conditions. Now, on the flip side, if we consistently avoid evil and do good, we accumulate wholesome karma that tends towards rebirth in either the human realm or the heavenly realms. And in the human rebirth, this person will enjoy the pleasant results of action, which is basically the opposite of what you saw just now. Can you just quickly look through it? Okay, these are just examples that the Buddha gave. No hard and fast rule, okay, because karma is actually very complicated. Now, so in essence, if you perform an action that shortens the person's life, then you get an equivalent coming effect, all right? Conversely, if you always look after the elderly, you take care of them in a hospice, and you saved a person's life, so in your next life, you will have a very long lifespan. Okay, uh, same thing. It doesn't need to take effect in a subsequent life. It can take effect here and now in this lifetime. Subject to the right conditions. Okay? So, what you see here are just general guidelines. The karmic results of actions, remember, does not depend on the action alone. It can depend on other variable or factors, like, for example, the effort that you put in. Okay, whether it's premeditated murder or manslaughter, for instance, and、uh, it can depend on the purity of the recipient and also whether there are mitigating factors involved. Okay, <clears throat> now, if a person achieves Arahanship. Can he escape the unpleasant results of karma? And if not, can his attainment offset or dilute this unwholesome karma? Let's go back to Anguili Mala. Now, after he achieved Arahanship, he went for his alms round, and he was hurt when the villagers threw things at him. Then he went back to the Buddha. It was very sad. And the Buddha told him this Bear it, Brahmin, bear it, Brahmin. You are experiencing here and now the result of deeds because of which you might have been tortured in hell for many years, for many hundreds of years, for many thousands of years. So from here it is obvious that we cannot totally escape bad karma. No matter how much good we have. But the effects can be diluted. And in the case of Anguilimala, because he was fully enlightened,、okay, the ill effects of his karma w a s diluted to a very large extent. So that is one more incentive for us to get enlightened. Now, our journey to Nibbana takes several lifetimes. 
and we can practice Dharma only in the human realm and the heavenly realms, but very much more effectively in the human realm, okay? Now, if we take rebirth in these two destinations, well and good. But if we take rebirth in the lower realms, there is no way we can practice Dharma. The Buddha already said so. And he also said that those people who live out their lives in these lower realms are usually reborn there again and again. Very difficult to get out. Okay, so that is why moral discipline is very important. Without this foundation in morality, there's very little chance that we can have future rebirths that are favorable to spiritual practice. Next, practical applications. Now, most of you will be familiar with these five points, yeah, because we kept bringing this up in the morality, Dhamma bites, or right action, right speech, and right livelihood. I've just rearranged it a little here. Now, remember, they are not distinct areas of practice, uh, but we separate it to make it easier to understand. They're all interrelated, interdependent. Okay, first, we are going to look at constant reflection on past, present, and future actions. Now, remember again the system of ethics that the Buddha laid down for us okay, is derived from the law of cause and effect, the law of karma. So when we reflect on our actions and know that these have consequences, okay, we will tend to be more restrained in our actions and we will shape our intentions and actions in a way that will not harm and therefore cause suffering to self and others. And we will also shape our intentions and actions in a way that will benefit self and others. In this sutta, the Buddha actually taught Rahula how to reflect on past, present, and future actions. Okay, for those who are new, I'll give you some time to admire this piece of teaching by the Buddha. This is a very important sutta. Or you can take picture. Oh, they can go back and admire, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think whatever we do, okay, it's very, very important that we look at our own minds. Remember this, when we get angry, we are practicing anger. When you're filled with envy or jealousy, we're actually practicing envy and jealousy. And every time these mind states arise and we act on them, they actually get stronger and then slowly they'll settle into habits and eventually they will form part of our character. So likewise for wholesome mental states. And each and every action, remember, brings you either further away from Nibbana or closer to Nibbana. Okay, let me give you an example. I'm sure all of you in your life have come across a person who came up to you and spoke angrily to you, made unfair, what you perceive as unfair comments. You think you don't deserve them. And what happens? Oh, I can feel the anger arising already and indignation, yeah? And worry over your reputation, so on and so forth. Then you want to, you know, go back. But then you think, ah, yeah, not right speech. You know. What to do? Uh, Buddha says her right speech must be true, beneficial, timely, gentle, spoken with loving kindness. But if you're going to open your mouth and scold this person, the only thing could be maybe truth. Lah. The rest, all four, don't have. Lah. Okay, so, but then if you don't scold her, huh, Wow, you hold it inside, oh, wow, I want to die like they turn blue and die. Or you find, wow, they call it ne sang, internal injury, must come out, okay? So, cannot, cannot, you open your mouth, you score. Okay, then after that, you regret it. Okay, all of us have encountered situations like this. Okay, where we are not always able to stop our unskillful actions. But if we know it's unskillful, even when we are doing it, 
That is mindfulness. And that is wisdom. And this awareness will hopefully give us that little sense of what the Buddha called hiri, shame. Okay? And also the inspiration to exercise more restraint in future. Now, this is what Ajahn Jaya Saro says. Very important. Listen to the news every day. Listen many times. Not the news on the screen or a newspaper, but the news of your body and mind. This is the most important news. That's why I don't read newspapers nowadays. <laughs> what is happening now? Observe how your actions and speech affect your mind. Observe how your mental states condition your actions and speech. This is how we investigate the law of karma in everyday life. Okay? Now, in essence, every time when we reflect on our actions, we learn from them and we recommit ourselves to skillful actions, we are strengthening morality. And this will actually act as a foundation for the other four areas of practice. Okay, next, moral reminders. Now, we chant this right every time uh, in front of some Buddhist classes and ceremonies because it reminds us of our moral obligation to observe these precepts. And then another useful reminder, I'm sure some of you will know what's coming up. You all memorized already, not? See whether you are right. Karma is my resort. The resort here means support, refuge. Okay? In fact, every time when you pay wise attention to your thoughts, your speech, and your mind, and you reflect on them, do you know what you're doing? You're actually bringing up the Buddha's teachings in your mind over and over again because you have to refer to his teachings to see what is skillful and what is not. That is itself the most important moral reminder. The practice, okay? Now, what else helps us to remember moral precepts better? Let's talk about the brain first. Now, these four parts of the brain, they play an important role in processing and storing memories. But the in interesting one is the amygdala. Okay, it regulates emotions like fear and aggression, and it determines what memories to store and where to store it, depending on whether the emotional response is weak or strong. Okay? Now, strong emotional responses to an event produces brain chemicals that strengthens memories. Let me ask you this. Who over here can still remember the 9-11 terrorist attacks on Twin Towers? Can all of you remember? Yes, because it was horrifying, isn't it? When did it happen? 2001? Was, huh? Ah, oh, yes. I remember that time I was pregnant with my daughter. Yes. So, many, many years ago already, we can still remember, right? So, that's why when something makes a very strong emotional impact on your mind, you can remember it better. So, what role does it play in our Dharma practice? We choose the Buddha's teachings and make a strong impact on our minds. Okay, if you have the time and you're brave enough, <laughs> look through these suttas. Well, this is time to take picture. Okay? Now, here the Buddha actually describes what the ghost realm is like, what hell realm is like, how very difficult it is to get to the heavens, how easy it is to fall into the lower realms, and how difficult it is to climb up again. Now, why did the Buddha share all these kind of morbid facts with his disciples? It is to instill in them the sense of what we call otapa, okay? O-T-A-P-P-A, -P -P which Ajahn Jasaro best describes it as the healthy fear of wrongdoing. Okay, let me share you what Ajahn Chia says, which is not as scary but nevertheless actually gave me that very strong sense of otapa. Every time one do anything unskillful, I just have to remember this. 
Morality is very important, and you must try to look after it with every breath, every step of the way. If you break your precepts, all kinds of unpleasant things can happen to you. Sometimes it might be stomach ache. Sometimes you might rave deliriously in your sleep, have nightmares. And sometimes it might be animals or spirits coming to harm you. So keep reflecting on your morality. So moral reminders can also take the form of Dharma talks like these, the Dharma books, and of course, best of all, I said before, the practice itself. Okay? That means always paying wise attention to your mind at all times. Now, linking morality to karma, more specifically, your intention, means that you have to develop a power of introspection and self-examination, which means reflection, right? Because reflection requires honesty and ability to see clearly into your own mind and to remind ourselves of what is skillful and what is not skillful. You need to educate yourself in these two aspects, one and two. Okay, to the extent that we will not rationalize greed, la, fear, la, hatred, prejudices, and other unwholesome states, other defilements, so automatically. Let me give you a very good example. How many of you drink here? <laughs> Alcohol consumption, okay? Now, many say that drinking is necessary, especially when you have to entertain clients. Some say it's very good for health, and it helps you to unwind after a hard day's work. And people say it's also a good way you know, to bond with your relatives and friends, you know, at gatherings, at weddings, at New Year's Eve party, etc., etc. Now, if you think the same way, think harder. Are you trying to justify your love of drinking? Just think. We use this sentence to justify a lot of our defilements, don't we? A lot of people also justify their drinking by saying that they drink only a little, never, uh, never enough to cause heedlessness. Okay, or that I can hold my drink very well, I never get drunk. Okay. But we already know the dangers of drinking, don't we? Social drinker or not, the moment you put that cup to your lips, you are already exposing yourself to all these dangers of drinking. Okay, I want you all to think, for those who started drinking only a little bit, has your drinking increased or decreased over the years? How much do you like that buzz that comes with drinking? that helps you to temporarily forget your problems. And then, when you know you are going to an event that serves very good and very expensive alcohol for free, how much do you look forward to this event? Okay, Where do you draw the line? If there is a line to begin with. And if there is, has this line moved over the years? And in which direction? Go back and think about it. Mull over it. It's <laughs> How mild? Okay, we face a lot of influence and peer pressure, okay, from at work, from friends, in society as a whole. Alcohol consumption is just one of them. Okay, this one I'm very sure none of you here do, lah. recreational drug use very acceptable in some societies. And then you know what? Strong emotions are encouraged in the business world, like passion, ambition, because they believe that increases competitiveness that makes a person more productive. Killing is justified in wartime. Killing for food. Live seafood restaurant? Revenge is acceptable too. You see those da da sa sa shows or not? Last time when I was young, my father would bring me to watch all these uh, pugilistic shows. Uh, 
always revenge one. Can revenge many generations. One. Okay, that kind. <laughs> okay, casual sex is also acceptable to a lot of people. And white lies, definitely okay. Okay? Now, all these are deemed acceptable in the eyes of the majority. So it must be okay, right? Unfortunately, under the law of karma, it is not okay. Sadly, we cannot escape the fruits of our unwholesome actions, even if we have very valid reasons for committing them, like killing to protect home and country, stealing food for your children because you have no money to feed them, making the decision to abort the child because of danger to the mother, or putting a pet to sleep because it is suffering so much. But the coming weight for these actions are very much less okay, than those that arise from purely unwholesome actions. So you can't escape the coming effect. The validity of natural laws governing human behavior does not depend on people's desires. If one is about to perform an action that results in falling into hell, it is better to acknowledge that this action is bad but that one is still willing to suffer the consequences than to delude oneself into thinking that one is doing nothing wrong. Okay, so if you have to drink to entertain clients and you can't find any reason to escape it, ask yourself this. Can you really not find any reason or you're just not trying hard enough because you enjoy drinking? Okay, but whatever the reason, do not rationalize. Acknowledge that you are not observing this fifth precept, either for the sake of a career or you're just not ready to give up drinking. This approach to life is a much more honest one. Don't you think so? Yeah, you may not be observing the fifth precept, but you are definitely observing the fourth one. You don't lie to yourself. Okay? Just remember, we make the choice because we are the owner of our own karma. We have to weigh the pros and cons. Next. Now, a 21 4 study found that friends often bond by providing one another with moral support to resist a temptation. However, okay, they are also more likely to be partners in crime when it comes to enjoying sense indulgences. So, not surprisingly, we start to act like the people we surround ourselves with, either in virtue or in vice. So, this actually was taken from, it's taken from the Sigalawada Sutta, which you saw last week. I give you just a little bit of time to quickly look through it. Now, remember, not easy to walk this path. We need spiritual friends. You cannot practice in isolation because that friend will tell you when you falter in the path, you feel very discouraged, she will give you words of encouragement, okay? will tell you when you're breaking a precept or you rationalize too much. And I'm very sure everyone knows that we have to keep close to the wise ones and why. I don't even need to explain this. I'll give you a short time to look through this also from the Sigalawada Sutta. Okay? How long? So, the people we keep company with uh, can greatly effect, affect how we practice the other four areas. Next, ah, there's so much we can do here. Uh, at the very beginning, we can refer to Sigalo Wada Sutta for all the detailed do's and don'ts and other uh, teachings that the Buddha gave. Okay, and uh, since we are wrapping up the Dharma Bites on morality here, we are going to look at the Dharma training as a whole. Okay, and we're going to take into consideration all these five points and with emphasis on mental training because what we say and what we do actually 
comes from our intentions, right? And we're also going to look deeper into the subtleties of our behavior. Now, very first, doing good means what? Cultivating wholesome states of mind, okay? And I know, I'm very sure all of you can name the whole range of them. And why? Number one, it makes us more tolerant of other people's shortcomings. Remember when other people do wrong things, or what you call unskillful things. Okay, do not judge. Do not think that they are evil people. Okay, they do it because they do not know any better. But you do. So you become more tolerant. And it also helps you to be more forgiving, okay, to be more empathetic. And we also can help more generously, and we become more contented and grateful for what we have. Now, as we have seen earlier, cultivation of wholesome states of mind okay, is more effective if we also exercise sense of restraint. Now, in this aspect, the simplest, but not necessarily the easiest thing to do, I'm sure you all know, is what? Meditation. Okay. When we meditate, we do not harm self and others, right? Sit down there, how to have sexual misconduct. Yeah? And we are also letting go of the five the hindrances. Now, studies have shown that meditation also increases a person's responsiveness and motivation to relieve the suffering of others. You become more compassionate. Now, meditation also gives rise to skill. We build up mind muscles okay, to help us pay attention to our meditation object, both within and outside meditation. And paying attention to the mind means that there are times when we have to look more deeply into our intentions. For example, we decide to intervene to right or wrong. You see someone being bullied, or you see an animal being tortured. Okay? We have to know to what extent our involvement is prompted by the desire to help, to what extent this is desire for justice, and to what extent is revenge. Then you ask yourself, what mental states are present? Is anger there? Is hatred there? Is self-righteous indignation there? And ask yourself this, are these mental states wholesome or unwholesome? Can you rely on them to make sound judgments? Okay, we may think that we're acting with very wholesome intentions. Yet, sometimes when you look into your mind with more honesty, you may find other motivations there as well. Let me give you an example. Okay, uh, they want to build a new hospital wing and they're asking for donations. And they say, anybody who donate over $10,000 will have your name uh, put up on this board right at reception area. Then you are very rich. Uh. Ah, no problem, 10000 Okay, Think about it. Why you come up with the amount 10000 eh? And if uh, they ask you, donate anonymously, think again. Will you donate 10000 So to what extent is it generosity and compassion? And to what extent is this need for recognition, the ego? Okay, it always comes back to the ego. It doesn't mean oh, that oh, yeah, they are a very bad person. No, it just means you know yourself better. You have to know yourself better and accept yourself for what you are first. And training morality also means taking care with the effect our actions may have on others. Again, some of these actions may be very subtle. For example, when you give advice to a person, are you actually criticizing them? Are you being condescending? And are you giving advice because you think it will be well received? Or are you giving unsolicited advice? Again, if it's unsolicited advice, are you giving it maybe to show the person that you're better than the person and you know more than the person? Ah. Think about that. And also, like, for those who have kids, okay, when you lecture your child, do you say hurtful words or you say encouraging words? 
What is your body language when you talk to other people? All these you have to be very careful, very mindful of. Whether we are working, meditating, or whatever, there's always an opening for us to change our obstructive habits. See, all these examples that I give you, pay attention to them. And slowly know yourself better. And ask yourself, is this what I want to be? If you notice that you're always giving unsolicited advice, how do you want to manage that? So you have to keep thinking and reflecting on your actions. Okay? It takes mindfulness to see our habits, and it takes effort and patience to change those habits. But it is possible and vital to do so. Okay? And this progress is very gradual. And slowly, if you keep watching your mind and changing it bit by bit, taking all these baby steps, gradually you'll find yourself, you know what's going to happen? You will think twice about harming even insects. Okay? You'll be more willing to part with your possessions to help others. You'll be more content, actually, with simple food, less holidays, less spending, less shopping, and you will be happy for others, even though they may be richer than you, more good-looking, more intelligent, more successful. And you may even prefer meditation to watching TV. Yeah. <laughs> and this all will happen very naturally and very gradually. And most importantly, you will feel joyful. Okay? This joy and this feeling of non-regret will form a very important foundation for our spiritual journey. The joy part is very important. And lastly, this is a Dharma part of verse. Faint is this fragrance of lavender and sandalwood, but fragrance of the virtuous source sublime amongst the gods. This forms the basis for puja of incense.